Welcome to the Doherty Water for Food podcast. Since 2010, the Doherty Water for Food Global Institute at the University of Nebraska has worked toward one goal, a food and water secure world. One in which global food security is ensured without compromising the use of water to meet other essential human and environmental needs. It's a daunting vision, but one that is vitally important. This podcast amplifies the voices of those making waves in this space. We hope you enjoy today's episode. Welcome to this episode of the Water for Food podcast. My name is Ariana Elness. I'm the communications specialist for the Doherty Water for Food Global Institute. And we are talking today about glacial melt and its downstream effects on food security. I am really excited to have this conversation today. It's really an honor to be joined here today um, by Randall Ritzema, Tika Gurung, and Nick Brozovic. They each are highly accomplished and bring valuable perspective to the conversation. So first I'll introduce uh, Randall Ritzema. He is Water for Food's research manager. He recently contributed to research in the Hindu Kush Himalaya region with the International Center for Integrated Mountain Development. And we'll talk a lot more about that report's findings in this episode. Randall, thank you for being here. It's a pleasure. Thank you. And next we have Tika Gudung, who has a master's degree in glaciology from Kathmandu University in Nepal. And he's now a graduate student at University of Nebraska-Lincoln at the Department of Earth and Atmospheric Science. Tika, thank you for being here today. Yeah, thank you for the given. And then next we have Nick Brozovic, who is the Director of Policy at Water for Food, and he brings experience in worldwide water policy, management, and economics. Nick, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, Ariana. It's a pleasure to be here. And I could say a lot more about each of these three, but I will link to their bios in the show notes. And Randall, we'll get started with you. You recently contributed to research in the Hindu Kush Himalaya region with the International Center for Integrated Mountain Development, or ISAMAD, in a report called Water, Ice, and Society. Could you just start by telling us about that region and why it's so significant to researchers? Yeah, I, before coming to the Doherty Water for Food Global Institute, I worked for ISAMOD uh, for a time uh, out of Kathmandu, Nepal. And the report that was just published earlier this year uh, that we're going to talk about today is a result of some changes that we're seeing in the mountains, of what we would call the Hindu Kush Himalaya region. So the, the Hindu Kush Himalaya region is a region in Asia, cuts across most of Asia uh, through all or part of eight countries. It's an area that encompasses the tallest mountains in the world, and in fact, uh, all of the mountain peaks uh, in the world that are over 23,000 feet are contained in this region. So very high elevation, and it's in this very high elevation area where we have a, a large buildup of ice and snow. And in fact, the region is called the Third Pole because it contains the largest volume of ice and snow outside the polar regions. And these, uh, these glaciers and, and the snow in the high elevations of this region, um, we, we call it the cryosphere. It's basically this, this high elevation zone. And it, it turns out that this zone is very important uh, because not only is this region uh, contain these very tall mountains, but it's also highly populated. And so there are about 240 million people living in the region itself, and the glaciers and the snow, or the, the cryosphere region in the Hindu Kush Himalaya, are an important water source for 12 major river basins downstream. So if we expand our view a bit beyond just the Hindu Kush Himalaya region to the, the wider view of these river basins, the, the melt from the cryosphere uh, affects up to nearly 2 billion people. So it's a, it's a critically important resource. And the reason for this report that was published by ISSIMO early this year 
was to look at the changes that are happening in the cryosphere. The Hindu Kush Himalaya sounds like this unique region with a huge volume of snow and ice at high elevation, and is also a critical water source. Before we get into the research, Tika, you were actually from Nepal, and though you didn't work directly on this report, you've also worked with ECMOD in the past and actually worked with Randall for a time. You've been gathering glacial data in the region, so could you talk about how you've been contributing to research on glaciers and the cryosphere in the Himalayas? We were kind of generating the uh, knowledge itself uh, based on the uh, real monitoring the uh, highest part of the, the world. So we were monitoring the different glaciers from Nepal to uh, Pakistan, even in um, uh, sorry, Afghanistan and in Bhutan. Like, uh, but um, I was mainly responsible to conduct the field um, observation in Nepal itself. So I had to visit the glaciers on a frequent basis. I had to do a lot of uh, measurement of the changes of glacier itself, how much it is changing annually or biannually. And then we found that the uh, most of the glaciers are losing the mass in accelerating rate as compared to the global rate. But, uh, but they, are, they are not uh, melting at the same time. They are melting in a contrasting rate. Some of them are melting so fast and then some of them are still in steady state or they are gaining mass mostly in the western part of the Himalayas that we call the Karakom region. So uh, all work is kind of related to the, the report that is published by Isimod. The motivation for this report that Isimod published and to which uh, the Doherty Water for Food Global Institute, along with many others, contributed is that the cryosphere in the Hindu Kush Himalaya is changing and glaciers are melting. Tika talked about that a little bit. Snow cover is, is declining and there it was enough of a change uh, whereby you know there, there was this idea that we needed to raise the awareness of the changes happening in the cryosphere because so many people downstream are dependent on it or are affected by it, either through water supply or in the case of excessive flows, flooding and, and other sort of disaster and catastrophe related issues. So that was the motivation behind the report. I was a contributing author on that report. Tika was providing uh, monitoring and behind the analysis, some of the analysis that was included in that report. We'll talk more about the research in a moment, but first, Tika, would you describe the experience of monitoring glaciers and collecting data? Yeah, I, I was not directly involved in the highway um, report mm -hmm. itself. I was supporting them through the actual data sets itself. I was measuring the glaciers in biannual or annual basis so that uh, from that data sets that we could say that the glaciers are actually losing, basically. I used to visit on a glacier on a regular basis, I say. It's not easy to go to the glacier in the Himalaya itself. For example, if you are doing glaciology in Europe, if you are going to Alps, or if you are doing, I think, the, in, in Rocky Mountains here, it's, uh, Logistically, easy. it is easy compared to, compared to Himalaya region. But in the Himalaya region, you need to walk almost a, a week or more than that just to get to the uh, glacier. And then you spend almost a week or more than that on the glaciers by doing different uh, kind of uh, uh, survey, like just, just measuring the glaciers by putting the, the locally available bamboo stake um, and then we measure the thickness each year, and then um, by the, uh, from that we can calculate how much the glacier is gaining or losing the mass. And in sub to support these findings, we had also installed so many weather stations to measure uh, measuring the, the uh, snowfall or precipitation in a hole, and the temperature itself, and the different kind of uh, 
climatic variables and then also um, just below the glacier we also used to monitor the the discharge how much discharge is coming coming from the glacier itself and from the surrounding environment so these glaciers are extremely difficult to get to and you're not just hiking there you're also bringing equipment and setting up weather stations to collect these scientific data sets of glacial mass, all sorts of climatic variables, glacial discharge. It's really amazing. Tika, could you also describe your observations on some of the changes in the region? We could see that glacier is melting. Mm -hmm. That's obvious, but uh, in a different way. But one of the uh, consequent from glacial melt is the glacial lake outburst flood. That's mm -hmm. one of the uh, key challenges in the Himalayan, Himalayan region. We could we can take example from the last October glove event in Sikkim, Himalaya. So they have lost, I think, around 1200 megawatt hydropower project. And then we lost so many uh, families. So there were a lot of casualties from that uh, event. So that is uh, one of the uh, challenges we are facing right now because of these changes. I think there are many um, incident happening because of this uh, glacial melt, um, not only glacial melt, uh, like snow melt, and then even we have permafrost, which is I think uncovered topic um, until now in the Himalayas, because we can't see the permafrost itself, itself, it is kind of permanently frozen ground beneath the, um, the surface, uh, so it is also kind of thawing. So you have these gloffs or glacial lake outburst floods which are these extremely hazardous and sudden events of large amounts of water. And of course, we also have shrinking glaciers, which of course you were monitoring. So these changes were, Randall, as you mentioned, the motivation of the report. But could you talk more about the focus of the ECMAD report on water ice and society? The report focused initially on changes in the cryosphere itself and that's glaciers are melting faster than they're being replenished by precipitation on an annual basis. So in effect, the glaciers are shrinking. Tika's talked about that. Snow cover is, uh, is declining as well. Uh, the second area that the report covered was then what, what are the implications on water resources? And if you think of the cryosphere as glaciers and snow areas as a, as, a, as a buffer zone, the cryosphere accepts precipitation and holds it in the, in, the cold, in the monsoon season. And then in the warmer, dry season, it slowly releases that water, which you know all of these people downslope then use. Um, the, an, another part of the report was looking at the implications on society then. So the cryosphere in its buffering role provides more water in the driest part of the year and reduces the peak flow in the wettest parts of the year. So it reduces flooding risk while providing water supply for urban areas downstream for industry. And I think from the perspective of our institute, importantly, it provides irrigation water. Uh, for a vast area down downstream. And it becomes even more so, Tika mentioned, when you look at the western side of the, of the Himalaya, the Hindu Kush Himalaya, where most of the water that's used for irrigation is melt water. So, so far we've defined the cryosphere as basically regions of snow and ice at high elevations, and talked about how the slow, timed release of this water is so important to the Hindu Kush Himalaya region, particularly for the water management of agricultural societies downstream. Nick, is there anywhere else in the world that depends on a healthy cryosphere for agricultural use? Thank you for the question, Ariana. And let me start by acknowledging it, uh, how wonderful it is to hear Tika talk about the landscape and the culture in Nepal. It, it is a unique landscape uh, and, and very different in many ways uh, to many other places, and, and the report highlights those challenges that are happening there. If we zoom out from that, we can see that there, there are many parts of the world 
where most of the water that is available um, at times that humans need it uh, comes from melting snow and ice in mountains. So this is the effect that Randall was referring to. So in many basins, and I, I'll pick two ones very close to home. One is the Platte River Basin, which is our local river basin here in Nebraska that, that drains much of Nebraska and originates in the Rockies. That is a snowmelt dominated basin. The other basin that's been in the news a lot in the US in recent years is in California. So much of the Central Valley of California and much of California is also snowmelt dominated. And in those systems, you have a lot of precipitation in the winter uh, and in the spring, and then the summers tend to be quite dry. And so from a uh, food and water security perspective, you're counting on snow melting at the right time to put water in the streams and rivers in the right time that you can then take out for irrigation. In those systems also, you typically have a system of dams and canals uh, based on the hydrology that uh, existed at the time that um, the canals and dams and that hydraulic infrastructure was constructed. And in some ways, the challenge that we have in much of the world is that we have a uh, 20th century hydraulic infrastructure, but the 21st century hydrology has now changed from the infrastructure that we built. And so uh, one of the results of that is that we see uh, effects like flooding where the storage isn't sufficient to hold the, the meltwater so that when there are droughts, we don't have enough water in storage for those droughts. So examples of that in uh, locally would be the kinds of events that we had in 2019 where, where we had extreme flooding here in Nebraska. You can look at the uh, flood and drought cycles that are present in California where uh, there can be multiple years of extreme drought followed by uh, single event rainstorms that might produce a year of precipitation in one rainstorm. One of the particular challenges in snowmelt dominated basins is if precipitation falls as rain instead of snow, then that can lead to a much more release of water than is usual and that creates both downstream flooding in the moment, but it also creates a challenge later in the growing season that the water that should have been there to melt is no longer there to melt. So e even though kind of the landscapes might look different and, and the landscape in Nebraska and the landscape in Nepal are very, very different and, and beautiful in different ways. But the basic or one of the basic concerns, which is that there's snowmelt dominated basins where the hydrology is changing. And as a result, there are uh, both increasingly likely droughts and increasingly likely floods. That is true in both, both of those regions. And from a food and water security perspective, that creates a, a management issue. It creates an economic issue for the growers that are depending on, on water to, to be able to finish their crops and, and uh, get them to market. I'd like to talk a bit more about the risks to crops and farmers, which is really a risk to food security. As the cryosphere changes, what are the challenges that producers will face? The cryosphere provides a significant amount of water that's used downstream for urban demands, industrial demands, and, and also for, for irrigation, importantly. As the cryosphere melts or changes, it will change the timing of flows and the timing of melt, uh, which will change the, the timing of the irrigation supply downstream. There are roughly 130 million farm households in, in three basins alone, the Ganges, the Indus, and the Brahmaputra river basins that are dependent on meltwater for surface irrigation. And that irrigation, of course, needs to be timed along with, with planting, you know, the, the crop cycles. 
And so changes in the water availability could affect what crops are planted, the, the timing of those crops, it could then affect crops that follow, etc. And then there's a, a second effect, if water isn't available for existing crops at the right time, then these households that have to irrigate will pump more groundwater, which in the case of these vast plains areas below the Hindu Kush Himalaya is a real problem because of uh, the overdraft of, of groundwater in recent decades and dropping water tables. So there are cascading effects from changes in the cryosphere, cascading effects through water resources that flow downhill and then you know it may affect groundwater as well. So in this region water security and food security are very tightly linked. Farming is, is a risky business and water reduces the risk of farming by reducing the likelihood of having drought impacts on, on crops. And so a lot of these changes in the cryosphere essentially increase the risk of farming. Uh, and depending on where you are, there are engineering or insurance mechanisms to mitigate some of those risks. One of the challenges in the Hindu Kush Himalaya is that most farmers don't have things like crop insurance, uh, and that amplifies the effects, the economic effects and, and the social effects of changes in the, in the hydrologic cycle. By now we know that the glacier is losing mass, but the problem is that no one wants to share the data. So suppose I, now I'm working here in uh, Lincoln, and then if I want to get the data sets from the Himalayan region from the different country, so no one is willing to share the data. So, and because of there are so many transboundary trans issues, that might be political or di different reasons. So I just wanted to say that th this is science, so science should be kind of collaborated, right? So, yeah, I just wanted to say that. Wow, thank you. You know, that's a really good point. And this new report and huge wealth of information put out by ECMOD was really only possible through a huge collaboration of international partners and really drives home that point of how critical collaboration is. There are of course these major challenges, but where have you seen examples of adaptation to a changing climate? Mountain communities are already attempting to adapt. By nature, these mountain communities are already very resilient. They live in challenging environments. So in a way, these communities are, are used to the idea of adapting to challenging conditions. But there's already evidence that the crops planted are, are being changed, agricultural systems are shifting, the seasons are beginning to shift, uh, linked to water availability. And most of the implications, I think, are in the projected realm still. There's a there's a lot of work and studies looking at the projections to the end of the century and what it might mean, again, for the more populous areas downstream. But mountain communities are highly dependent on agriculture and livestock. Roughly 80% of these farm households in the mountains are, are farmers They're and livestock keepers. I can add a little bit more on the adaptation side. As Randall pointed out, changes in crop management practices are important. Uh, the same is true in the US. You see uh, cover cropping is one of the practices that we're seeing, and there are multiple benefits of cover cropping and, and low-till, but some of those are around preserving soil moisture uh, at the start of the growing season. As you find the timing of water availability different, a lot of the adaptation practices try to take uh, things that become floodwaters and, and store them for later use in ways that don't require new infrastructure. So I'll give two examples. Uh, in Nebraska, there have been several successful programs to take uh, floodwaters and run them into dry canals. Now, irrigation canals typically only are used in the summer during the irrigation season but it has been possible over the last few years um, through interesting agreements between the irrigation districts 
and the uh, state of Nebraska to run floodwaters into the canals and recharge the aquifers underneath, which is a very clever reoperation. Uh, so that kind of managed aquifer recharge is something that we will see a lot more of. Uh, we see something similar in California where there are basins where uh, growers are actually being paid to flood their fields in winter uh, with, with excess floodwaters. And again, the logic there is exactly the same. Uh, this water is arriving at a time when it's not useful, but the more of it that can be stored, if any of it can be recovered later, there is a, uh, an economic benefit to doing that. A number of promising measures. Again, we were talking before the podcast started, there is uh, an equivalent in the Hindu Kush Himalaya, which is this, these ice stupas, which are essentially um, constructed ice towers where uh, stream flow in the winter is frozen in place um, and then is allowed to melt slowly during the spring and early summer. And, and at a village level, it does provide useful irrigation. So again, the idea is you capture water at a time when it isn't, when it's available but not needed, to keep it for a time when it is less available and is needed. So what gives you optimism? I think if you go just a decade ago, Himalaya was kind of unnoticed from, um, I think, rest of the world in terms of understanding scientific value of this Himalayan cryosphere. Um, because of the, I think, one of the IPCC report falls, they said that the Himalayan glacier will be vanished by 2035, something like that, but it, later on they collected it. After that report, the, all of the scientists were I mean, focused on this area. Now, so many researchers are focused on this, uh, on, the, uh, on the Himalayan glaciers, on the Himalayan, even uh, in a larger picture, in the Himalayan cryosphere. So, I hope that we can get more data. More data means more knowledge, and more knowledge means different ideas of adaptation and mitigation approaches. So, yeah, I'm very much optimistic about the research going on currently in the Himalayan region. And then, next thing is that now they are not only trying to understand the physical process of the glacier and its response to climate change and so on, but now they are also include, including including the societal aspect, like how this uh, change in the cryosphere is, is benefiting or affecting those communities and, and how does the migration happening because of those changes in the cryosphere. So I'm very much optimistic about the research going on in Himalaya. Yeah, my optimism would be that there's a link to what you said, Tika. Growing awareness of changes that's fairly new just in the last several years so my optimism is the words getting out people are becoming more aware it may seem like a long way away from here but the issues that are on a grander scale in the Hindu Kush Himalaya are certainly issues that we'll deal with here in the US as well yeah so our relationship to the cryosphere is changing and our reliance on the cryosphere is changing as well and I, I also have to be an optimist you know my general view is that human ingenuity is is high there isn't one solution to these issues but when we think about all of the options that we have we between uh, clever engineering solutions and clever agronomic solutions and clever economic solutions that can provide incentives for how and what and when people grow the food that we need when we think about risk management solutions such as insurance products. Um, between all of those things, I'm actually very optimistic that there are solutions to these problems. They require a level of creativity, uh, but to me, that's a, that's a good challenge to have. If you are listening to this and would like to learn more about research on the cryosphere and on research in the Hindu Kush Himalaya region, we are co-hosting a webinar on January 24th, 2024 with CGIAR on the food water nexus in mountain systems. Registration, as well as the recording after, will be linked in our show notes. Thanks so much for listening. Thanks for joining us this time on the Doherty Water for Food podcast. Make sure to visit our website, waterforfood.nebraska.edu 
to view show notes or subscribe so you don't miss future episodes.